uh, but I wanted to get us started with just a, a couple of announcements. My name is Richard Howarth. Uh, you are here. I hope you're here for the event with Ron Rash uh, in, in the Valley, uh, his uh, talk and or interview or dialogue with John Grisham, uh, which will start in just a few minutes. Um, first, I want to make sure some of our people know that we got two uh, upcoming events that are going to be interesting on Wednesday. Uh, two writers, M.O. Walsh and George Singleton, are going to be in conversation together, and both of them have new books out. Um, M.O. Walsh's book is called, is called The Big Door Prize, and George Singleton's book is called You Want More. The, both of these guys are sort of characters, so it ought to be interesting uh, tug of war to see who gets more time at, in that conversation. <laughs> I hope they don't start fighting. So that's Wednesday at 5 o'clock Central Time, 6 Eastern Time. Uh, and then on Friday of this week, uh, Larry Wells, who's from Oxford, uh, was married to the late Dean Faulkner Wells, um, uh, ran the Yachnipatawpha Press here, and has written uh, two or three novels, uh, has a memoir called In Faulkner's Shadow, which he's, he's definitely been in that. He lives here in Oxford, and he and his late wife lived in the house that um, William Faulkner's mother lived in. So uh, there's definitely a shadow there. He, so Larry Wells will be in conversation with Bill Dunlap, who's a um, um, an artist and a writer and a bon vivant, a Mississippi bon vivant. And so that he he's one of the he's the fastest talking Mississippian I've ever known. So that'll be interesting. Uh, so that's what's coming up. Uh, soon, uh, virtually from Square Books. Uh, today, very happy, as I say, to have Ron Rash here with his uh, new book, In the Valley, uh, a short story collection. Uh, this is his seventh story collection, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the title In the Valley is also uh, the title of the one novella in this book. Um, and those of you who read Serena will be interested in, in that. Um, he, Ron is a three-time winner of the O. Henry Award. Uh, he's won the 2019 uh, Sidney Lanier Prize for Southern Literature. And um, a previous collection of stories, Burning Bright, uh, won the 2010 Frank O'Connor Award. Uh, I, I know him best for One Foot in Eden because that's the novel that first brought him to Square Books in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, where we uh, we love that book and we and we pretty much loved them all ever since then, Ron. Um, he's written in addition to seven books now of short stories, seven novels, and five books of poetry. He's a distinguished professor um, at Western Carolina. Uh, he will be in conversation with John Grisham. I think all of you know who John Grisham is. Uh, he's written 35 novels, uh, one book of nonfiction, one book of short stories, and seven books for young readers. I think those are all Theodore Boone books. And he, I, it, I have to say this, first of all, I want to show you a picture, a, a, a cover of what In the Valley looks like. Uh, and we've got a signed copy, so if you order this from Square Books, you'll get a signed copy. And then in October, this book. A Time for Mercy, uh, it reads backwards in the screen I'm looking at, but anyway, <laughs> that will be, that will be out in October, and uh, John, I just, I read it recently, and I, it's, it's just great. He, uh, John goes back to uh, uh, the, uh, Jake Brigance, the protagonist of A Time to Kill, uh, in this story, A Time for Mercy, which is, it's just terrific. You're going to love it. So, uh, with nothing further, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Ron and John and let them take it away. I'll come back on later on, and when I do, um, if if later on you want to send me questions or just send them through the chat mechanism, and uh, I'll field some of those questions and give them to Ron and to John toward the end of the event. Okay, y'all have a big time. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, man. Are we, uh, we live? Uh, you were live. Okay. 
Hey, I'm John Grisham, and I'm uh, delighted to be back at Square Books, a uh, place I have uh, been to many times, uh, both to uh, sign books and to uh, buy books. Uh, we lived in Oxford for four years, from 1990 to 1994, and um, I spent a lot of time at Square Books, uh, as did my wife and my kids, but they kind of grew up there, and so it's, it will always be my favorite uh, bookstore. Uh, about three years ago, I was uh, touring a little bit with a book called Camino Island, and I decided to um, go to 30 bookstores around the country, great bookstores I'd heard about but never seen, and I met Ron Rash uh, at Malaprop's bookstore in downtown Asheville, North Carolina, one of my favorite towns, and uh, we, had a, we had a huge crowd. Uh, and we had a wonderful time uh, talking about books and writing and reading and whatever the crowd wanted to talk about. Afterwards, we had a very long dinner uh, at a great hotel there and uh, spent a lot, of, um, a lot of good time together. The crowd at Malaprops was, um, I've always considered Square Books to be my, you know, my home store. Uh, I think every writer has a place that you, uh, you consider to be your home territory. We got to Malaprops uh, that day. Uh, there was a really large crowd and I just assumed that because it was my book and I was on tour then all those folks were there to see me. Um, that was not true. Uh, I realized that uh, Malaprops in Asheville is Juan Rash's home bookstore and they were all there to see him and we had a wonderful time uh, talking books. So Ron, uh, good to see you again and I uh, uh, hope you're doing well. Well and uh, that, those were my relatives that came. <laughs> those were <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a lot. There were a lot of them. You got a lot of kids. <laughs> well, there are <laughs> in Western North Carolina. There are. <laughs> yeah, uh, they always expect free books. You ever have that problem? <laughs> uh, I wish books was the only thing my family wanted. Uh, oh, I, I, I got plenty of books to give them, but, uh, <laughs> but it was a very enthusiastic crowd, and, uh, yeah. and Ron uh, Ron charmed them. We had we had a lot of laughs and uh, a lot of good time together. So uh, you're back with um, your latest collection of stories, I think 10 stories and a novella, and uh, it was published when? Uh, about a month ago, yeah, uh, coming up about five weeks. So it's been out a little while and uh, it's good to have it out, yeah. How's the, uh, give us your description of a virtual book tour. How, how are you handling these things? I actually found that uh, it works better than I thought it would. And the great thing is I'm not nearly as tired because I haven't been in an airport. Uh, you know, I haven't been uh, losing, uh, you know, when I drive my rental car, ending up in another state. Uh, it, uh, it's a lot less stressful. Uh, but, you know, I miss not eating at Ajax's. Uh, I miss the people. And I'm sure you feel the same way. I mean, the great thing is once you're at the store, you know, uh, but uh, this is, I guess, the next best thing. Yeah, you know, I didn't, uh, when we, we met in 2017, that was the first time I had toured in, in a long time. I, I just, um, I didn't, well, I won't say I got tired of it. I got tired of some of the travel and, uh, you know, book tour sounds pretty romantic until you do 35 cities in 36 days. And I, I made that mistake many, many years ago. Uh, we used to have signings at uh, Square Books that uh, went on for a long time, big crowds and all that. I kind of got tired of actual the actual bookstores and I realized how much I missed it when I got out three years ago and uh, started going to some great bookstores and meeting uh, a lot of writers I've always admired and it was yeah. um, a real treat to, to meet you. Um, so let's talk about In the Valley, uh, a really wonderful book I read over the weekend. I read the novella first. I couldn't believe you brought back Serena. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping I was finished with Serena after the novel <laughs> came out in 2008. What, uh, why'd you do it? I think several reasons. I, I didn't want to do it, uh, but sometimes the characters, uh, you know, won't leave you alone. And that, that, that happened. Uh, I think some of the, the issues, environmental issues, I feel like are that I was so concerned about when I wrote Serena are actually more dire in the United States right now than then. So I felt like going back and showing that kind of destruction and, and, and what would happen was important. But also uh, the character Ross, who had been a minor character in Serena, has, had haunted me. And, and I felt like he had a story that I wanted to tell, that he wanted me to tell. So 
in a way, the impetus was as much with him, but also give him a reader a chance to see Serena without, you know, now she no longer has a husband, so she's completely free to do anything. That's scary when she's free to do anything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's, uh, she's quite a character. A, a, a question, I mean, she's a, she's a, you know, in American letters, she's a famous character because of the book was such a, a big seller and a famous book when it came out in 2008. I think it was, and then the movie came out a few years later. Um, did you contemplate a full-length novel with her? Um, I didn't. I just, in a way, I felt like, and, and partly was the way I finished Serena, uh, because I kind of projected, you know, decades into the future that I felt like I didn't want to go back to a full novel. But um, I've always loved uh, novella form. Uh, and I'd never written one. And uh, I found out it's a lot tougher than uh, I realized. But it seemed to fit what I had and the story I wanted to tell. So, uh, you know, it, it, I think it turned out the right length for what I was uh, trying to do. And, um, you know, I felt like, and as you know, because you've done sequels, I mean, there's always that sense you want the book still to hold together, even if someone hasn't read the other one. Yeah. Uh, or I want that. I'll speak for myself. And it was only when I got this kind of uh, metaphor of the uh, valley being like an ark and the animals leaving it, that I felt like, you know, I've got something complete here. Uh, do you have a copy close by? Yeah. Do you mind reading something? Uh, well, I'm glad to. Uh, I'll read the opening because I think that's a... I was going to I was gonna ask you to read the first paragraph yeah. of, the, of the novella. Okay. When Serena Pemberton stepped out of the Commodore seaplane in July of 1931, a small but fervent contingent of reporters and photographers awaited her. Except for the pilot, she was alone. Those who would accompany her to the logging camp, both beast and human, had arrived by ship the night before. They were already on the train that would take them from Miami to North Carolina all except for her minion Galloway, who procured an automobile to drive Serena to the station. As the metal ramp was ready, Galloway positioned himself beside the bottom step. He was short and wiry, shabbily dressed, a purple stump protruding from one sleeve. As cameras flashed mere inches from his face, he did not blink. As Serena descended, the first question shouted at her, addressed the rumors surrounding her husband's death. For a moment, it didn't appear she would answer, but when her booted feet settled securely on the ground, the question was asked again, but with a caveat, had she loved her husband? I love my husband, but one always learns from disappointments. We were, we were malaprops uh, three years ago uh, I forgot what section, I've forgotten what section you read, but it was, um, it was very uh, poetic and very beautiful. And I don't, I don't read when I do my signings. I just, I don't like to read my own stuff after I've read it. Uh, you're much better at it. And when you finish reading that day, uh, the crowd was mesmerized by it. You could have heard a pin drop. They were so, um, they were so into your reading and the way you read and the way you write. So, um, uh, what I want you to read was the first paragraph with the rattlesnake of chapter one. So, oh, okay. so, so flip, yeah. over, flip over one page. Okay. okay. I mean, you write, you write about nature so well and, and the, the conflict and, and violence. And, uh, I, I just love the opening okay. uh, paragraph sure. with Ross. All right. Ross saw the Eagle first. He was about to resume work, but instead leaned his ax handle against a tulip poplar tucked his hands in the back pockets of his overalls and watched the bird glide above the valley floor. The rest of the, the crew soon saw the eagle too. Henderson stopped rolling his mid-morning cigarette. Snipes lowered his newspaper and set down a last bite of biscuit. Having noticed the silence of his fellows, Quince opened his eyes and gazed drowsily upward. 
the eagle came toward the lower ridge, its shadow rippling over the slash and stumps the crew had left the previous day. Then the shadow paused. The eagle tucked its wings and javelin earthward. At the last moment, the wings fanned, talons stretching to seize and crush a rattlesnake's head. The men watched as the snake's body flogged the ground, its rattle winding down to a last feeble twitch. As the sound of a metal whistle, raptor and serpent rose as one, as though the reptile's body were revived and sudden winged, evoking the fire drakes of Abion. <laughs> and as we learn, uh, pretty soon the reader learns that uh, Serena, tra <laughs> she trains the eagles to, to uh, catch and kill rattlesnakes. Yeah. <laughs> what was the inspiration for that woman? Well, uh, that, you know, I'd, I'd seen hawks do that in the wild with snakes, pick up snakes. And I, uh, I thought, wow, you know, I wanted something that would really impress these loggers. And I thought, well, maybe she can go out and shoot the snakes. But, you know, that doesn't make you mythic. Uh, or training a dog, but I thought she could train an eagle, and, and then I had to figure out if that was even uh, remotely possible, and I actually ended up, you know, going to the National Falconry Association, and finally they, uh, and you know this from research, I got to the point where they said you needed to talk to Scott, and when they give you a first name, this is the, you know, you've gotten the fanatic, the person that only cares about this one thing, and uh, Scott was one of 12 people in the United States who actually hunted with an eagle. You know, he had trapped it himself, trained it. He hunted jackrabbits. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> kind of taught me. Yeah, he said, yeah, it would be possible. And actually, uh, you know, he kind of led me through it. And uh, in Mongolia, they actually hunt wolves with the same eagle, the one that she brings, the, the bird, you know, the bird that she actually brings from uh, Mongolia to North Carolina. So your, your research is, uh, is um, exquisite, but you also, um, you write about nature so well, you have to spend a lot of time out there. Yeah, I do, and, and I did. I, I was very lucky in that uh, my grandmother's farm was near Boone, North Carolina. It was on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Land actually bordered the Blue Ridge Parkway, and when I was a, a kid, I would spend my summers with her. And uh, I got to hear that language, which was great, you know, that old Appalachian dialect. But she would just let me roam free. It was like Huck Finn. I mean, she would pack, you know, like a couple of biscuits and uh, I, a lot of relatives lived around there. So I would just wander, you know, six, seven hours. And, uh, and, and it, you know, it wasn't so much I was going out there identifying flowers or plants, but, uh, you know, I was kind of taking it in, you know, the smells, you know, what it smells like in the woods, those kinds of things. And so I guess I came by it pretty honestly. <laughs> How about now? You spend a lot of time outdoors? Yeah, actually today, uh, you know, what I like to do in the mornings is just go out in the woods for about an hour, you know, no cell phone or anything and just walk around by, there's a river and it's just, I just love hearing the sound of that river. And I, uh, I'm doing that more and I just realized how, that really gets me ready for the day. Do you write every day? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty. Uh, I'm a, I'm pretty Protestant. <laughs> so, how much a day? Uh, I tend to go in about. Uh, sometimes I try to get in at least four, four to six. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm pretty good about that. I'm pretty disciplined, um, and um, yeah, I pretty much do it. Pretty much every day, uh, you know, I'll leave, I'll leave up some on the weekends. But uh, I think, you know, one thing, I don't know if you remember this, but we talked about this when you were in Asheville that, you know, being a baseball player, I was a runner in, in uh, high school, but also in college. I ran 800 meters. And, and that kind of discipline, daily discipline, I think really has served me well. And, you know, to me, it was almost a transition of everything that I'd learned from athletics. I was able to move into that. I mean, I think you sense maybe some of that to yeah. the discipline, the training, the idea of, you know, it's going to take years, whatever. Yeah. The inspiration is uh, crucial uh, to us, but, but people don't understand. A lot of writers don't understand the discipline. Uh, yeah. you, know, you're, you and I are both in our mid sixties and been writing for a long time and still write every day. 
but it takes that type of um, discipline. And it's not always, not all days are good. No. You have, you have, you have good days and bad days. Luckily there aren't as many bad days, but, but uh, what do you, what do you do when you have, you're having a bad day? What, what do you do when the screen stays blank and you can't write anything? I punish myself. <laughs> I, I lock myself in a room for at least two hours. And if I don't write a word, I know that, and, and I mean, I don't even have a view and I know that I'm going to be in there whether I write or not. And what's, what's really interesting about that. I mean, these are days I'd rather stab pencils in my eyes, but if I wait long enough, I'd say 90% of the time, eventually it may, you know, it may take 30 minutes, but, um, it'll eventually come, but I've never really had a big problem with writer's block. And I think part of it's just because to me, I don't wait for inspiration. Um, you know, uh, for me, it's more like a mule being out in a field, you know, you just kind of put the blinders on and, and go. Do you ever, uh, I mean, you've written so many short stories, which is uh, a form I will probably never try again. I tried it once and the stories were all, you know, far too long. They were long stories. It's just not something I took a liking to. A lot of poetry, a lot of novels. Do you write on, uh, do you write more than one story at a time? Um, what I tend to do when I'm working on a novel, I will do a draft of a novel and then I'll write a story. I, I tend to do it that way because I'm very slow as far as novel. I mean, I usually do about 12 drafts at least of a, a novel. I'm, I know you, you do it differently, but that, that's the way I work. But um, I, I tend to maybe have a couple of things going, but usually I concentrate on one thing at a time when I'm actually writing. I, I tend not to do the same thing, same day or even right. week. Do you, uh, when, you, when you have the idea, or you, you have an idea for a story, do you know up front that it's gonna be a short story or a novel or a novella? No, uh, actually, I, I never do. I usually, every, almost everything I write starts with an image. I mean, Serena just started, all I had was a woman on horseback. You know, that was the, I had, I knew she was strong and confident. I could tell that by her carriage, um, but that was it. But uh, no, I don't. And actually I've had, I've written uh, my first novel. At, uh, it would start as a poem, then a short story, then a novel. Third, you know, that's happened several times. And it's almost as if, uh, the characters or the image just says, you know, you need to do more. You know, there's more here. And uh, uh, with my third novel, I actually wrote the story. And then like three years later, I just realized that uh, this needed, uh, I, there was so much more I wanted to do. I had the pleasure of meeting John Irving a couple of years ago in uh, Toronto. We were doing a, uh, a live event, not a virtual event, in front of a big crowd in Toronto. And I had read somewhere that John Irving has said that he uh, not only knows the last scene before he writes the first scene, he writes the last sentence before he writes the first. Uh, I'm not that smart. I can't do that. But I, <laughs> one, 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 of my, one of my rules for writing popular fiction is that do not uh, start the first scene until you know the last scene. Uh, and that requires a lot of... Uh, uh, thought, outlining, planning. Um, how about you? I do it a little different. Um, I actually, and it's, it's in, in some ways kind of scary because I tend to, uh, because I start with images, I'll have a general idea of what I think is going to happen. Uh, but to me, what's what I love are the moments where suddenly the story goes in a way I had not anticipated. And okay. And, but the danger of that, of course, is that almost everything I've written, including every novel, about a year in, it just goes dead on me. And uh, some, you know, that happened with Serena. It happened uh, with my last novel. And, and I just kind of have to wait it out. And there's always that fear that, uh, you know, maybe I won't work my way out. So, I, yeah, I tend to work more instinctual. And, and I, in a way, it's... Uh, um, you know, I've, I've tried it the other way and it doesn't work for me. I think, you know, I think we all work differently and, and find the way that works for us. But uh, for me, uh, a lot of times I don't, I really don't know what's, what's going to happen. I'm glad you, I'm glad you use the word fear because it's, um, even though I, you know, I'm meticulous with the outline and some outlines I work on longer than I work on the novel. 
and so, and, and most outlines don't work. Well, once I get into the story and I, I can't, I can't, and you can't outline everything. And like you said, some of the most, uh, um, pleasurable moments in writing is when you, when you suddenly discover a character that you weren't planning on having or a, another subplot that just came out of nowhere. So you can't, you can't plan everything. You, you don't want to, you, you, you want to be surprised, but even with that level of, uh, uh, preparation and the outlines are several pages long uh, by the time I start the novel there comes a moment in every book uh, where I go through this phase of being really afraid is this story working is it yeah. is it too implausible is it you know and and I'm glad to hear you say that happens to you I think it happens to everybody yeah and and you know those, those unexpected moments are wonderful there's a great story about Flannery O'Connor she said that when she wrote a, the story, Good Country People, where the Bible salesman steals the wooden leg, that uh, she did not know he was going to steal that leg till she was writing that scene at the end. But if you read that story, you just think, oh, she had to have seen this thing coming. But I believe her, you know, she was a good religious woman. She wouldn't lie to us. Well, what do you prefer, a short story or the, the longer book or the novella? Or? I love short stories. I, that's the form I love the most. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think you enjoy it too. I mean, blood drive, I mean, you, you had a chance, I think, to do something with humor there that was fun, didn't you? I mean, uh, uh, with the short stories, uh, yeah, I mean, I have, a, I have a problem with humor because I always uh, use too much of it. I think I'm really funny. My wife doesn't think so. But uh, <laughs> I always put in, uh, even in like intense, courtroom scenes you know, or, or law firm scenes or, you know, really serious dramatic moments in a story. Uh, I'll sneak in a one liner or something that I think is really clever. It, it, always, it always comes out. Nobody else like, thinks it's funny. Or my wife doesn't or my, my editor doesn't, but uh, there have been some times when I had the chance to, to really uh, rely on or use a lot of humor. And in the short story, collection there were several moments I thought were really uh, really funny and they, and they stayed in the book but you, you got to be careful with it because you know we're not comedians <laughs> we're writing yeah. about very serious things yeah but blood drive worked I, I think maybe that would not that have been a hard to go 400 pages but uh, <laughs> no. those poor guys <laughs> I think what makes it really funny is because I grew up with them you know <laughs> you, you know those guys huh? yeah what are you working on now oh me I'm I'm kind of in between um, actually working on a little bit of humor. You know, interesting we should bring that up. And I think that's almost kind of a, a response to, to, you know, what these times are so troubling. I feel like I almost had to, uh, at least if I can't find anything else to laugh at, maybe I can amuse myself. So I've been, uh, you know, doing some humor and uh, it may be more therapy, but uh, it's been fun. I, I, you know, humor, uh, uh, it, you know, one, what I love about it is it has a kind of integrity because you can pretend you're profound or, you know, whatever, but you, you're either funny or you are. Yeah. 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 We, we laughed a lot that night uh, <laughs> at Malapops. There were a lot of laughs, laughs especially as the, uh, the, the wine bottle, uh, uh, the one bottle followed the other. We, we, we found a lot to laugh about. Um, yeah. Well, so, I remember the one that I thought was funny was that you were talking, I think you'd gone to Italy to research wines. And I, and I said, this is the difference between uh, me and John Grisham. Uh, you know, he goes to Italy. I go into my uncle's barn, you know, <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. A lot, a lot of good, a lot of good stories. No, the research, the research is, um, is all, you, you talk, you, you talk about going to a falconry uh, competition. I mean, you know, would you normally do that? I, I, I've been to, the research has taken me to a lot of places I never thought I'd go to, uh, like death row and, you know, five or six different states and uh, courtrooms and law offices and Italy for two or three books. And uh, so, you know, that's one of the side benefits of being able to write full time is you, uh, you get to, you get to do some research. And Oh yeah. And I, you know, I love, I love finding out about things I don't know well. Um, and, and I, and I love trying to get those things right. But of course, uh, inevitably I'll, you know, uh, the hearing aid that I thought was created in 1929 was actually created in the summer of 28. Somebody's going to write me a letter about that. 
but uh, that's okay. You know, we did the best we can to get it right. The letters are brutal, um, especially when you write sequels or series. I started mm -hmm. this. Uh, this kid series for uh, young readers about 10 years ago. It's all based on one kid, Theodore Boone, and I've written, I've written seven of them now. And after about the fourth book, I was getting uh, angry letters from 10 year old kids who were finding mistakes between book four and book one. And I'm too lazy to go back and I'm not, I, I cannot go back and read my stuff. I'm just too lazy. And I said, Oh God, I, I've got to do something about this. So I, I actually hired a person to read all, all seven oh, books and okay. you know, fix a bibliography or anthem, whatever you want to call it, cross index everything, names and street names and school names. And, uh, but I still get letters and, and I get letters. Um, I published a book uh, a year ago, a book called Guardians. It's a novel. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene that takes place in Kingsport, Tennessee. Well, I grew up in Mississippi. I know where Kingsport is. It's up in the mountains. It's more yeah, new than yeah. the and uh, I made some reference later about it being in West Tennessee, close to Memphis. Well, I knew that that, that was a mistake I should have caught. Mm -hmm. And the letters are still coming in. <laughs> you get caught, you make mistakes, and you, you, you can go back and fix them, I guess. But it's, uh, it's embarrassing to get caught in errors. <laughs> well, I had the most interesting was uh, my uh, third novel. Part of it deals with a uh, Civil War massacre in, in Western North Carolina. And... Uh, I'd read a whole book about the massacre. I'd read the New York Times 1863 event because it was uh, uh, Confederates coming in and killing Union sympathizers in, in the North Carolina mountains, 13 of them, uh, boys and men. And uh, I, I, you know, I'd done all this research. I'd visited the grave site and you know, all those things. And um, every account including the you know, 1863 New York Times, uh, the book that was researched said, you know, the last person killed was a, the 12 year old boy. So anyway, I get a call and this guy says, well, you know, you got it wrong. He wasn't the last one killed. Uh, it was actually his father. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's interesting uh, because, uh, you know, every, every source I've been to has said it was, uh, you know, the, the 12 year old and, and he, and I said, well, how do you, how did you find this out? What's your source? And he said, well, uh, my team of paranormal investigators and I went to the grave site and the ghost told us that he was the last one to die. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, you know, we finally get contact with the other world and some, you know, some information, not a cure for cancer or COVID, you know, on page 128, Ron Rash got this damn thing wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I, I learned to, I don't fear the mail, uh, but you know, and I do, I do look at it. Uh, there's too much to answer, but it's, it's, it's nice. Most of, most of the letters are very nice. Most of the people who take time to write, um, except when you get the uh, retired high school English teacher who, ha who makes a list of all your grammatical mistakes and it goes on for four or five pages and she's probably right. Uh, but you know, uh, she takes the time to write you that letter and you, you know, it's kind of amusing after a while, but, but anyway, speaking of COVID, um, how has it uh, affected you as a writer? I mean, does it, has it been distracting? Has it been inspirational? Are you, are, are you going to write a story about it? Well, it was one thing that un unfortunately, but in a way sort of fortunate as far as this book uh, in the Valley is that, I was finishing it up uh, when COVID hit, you know, in March, early April, I still hadn't turned in a final manuscript. And that actually allowed me to do a little more with uh, Ross in, in the Valley. You know, he loses his family in the 1918 flu epidemic. So I was able to really, uh, you know, emphasize that more. And I think kind of connect that to what's happening today and um, and also uh, neighbors. That first story about the um, um, you know the 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 kind of tribalism. I, you know, we we were starting to see some of the um, you know protests and things like that. And and that. So I think uh, in a sense, COVID did have an influence on this book. But uh, I've actually I'd be interested in hearing what you. I've, I I've actually writing as much, maybe even a little more, but I think it's just to get outside of it, you know, as a way of kind of getting away from it a little while. You know, it's, 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 it's a wonderful uh, 
we're lucky to be able to do it full time. And it, it's also, it takes us away from reality often because we do live in, uh, you know, for several hours a day anyway, you live in a fictional world. With a, t a Time for Mercy, it's a, you know, it's a sequel to A Time to Kill, which, which I published almost 30 years ago. And, mm -hmm. and it was um, uh, very uh, rewarding to go back to characters I created 30 years ago and spend time with them in, in um, the small fictional town in Mississippi. And, and I realized that that's where I, you know, unlike you, you stayed pretty much close to home your whole career as a writer. You, you, you don't venture too far away. And you tell these wonderful stories, historical stories, Civil War stories, you know, that, that, that are deep and richly textured and, and beautifully written. Do you, are you ever, do you ever think about leaving Appalachia to write a, a novel? Uh, I, I've thought about it some, uh, actually, uh, you know, one of the stories in there deals with uh, a French cave art, a soldier in France, but, uh, I'm just kind of, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm kind of feel like I, I'm not running out of material here and it's, it just seems my comfort zone. Uh, I think, uh, you know, maybe that's, uh, I guess Faulkner just, uh, I think sense that with writers such as Faulkner and Welch, I, I kind of see myself kind of, I need to be here, but you know, then you got Thomas Wolfe, James Joyce, they have to leave and I think their advantage is both ways, but, yeah. uh, I don't seem to be able to exhaust the stories yet, so. Uh, That's good to hear, Ron. That's yeah. good. I want you to stay there. The I'm book is in the valley. Got it right there. Yeah. Great book. I finished it over the weekend. Thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, like all your stuff. I see Richard is back. Richard, do you have questions yeah. for us? Well, I have questions from from uh, s some of the viewers, or one of the viewers, um, and it's kind of along the lines of what y'all were just, what you just asked, Ron, but the question is, um, Ron, did, did you have family in the lumber industry? Where did you learn the innards of the lumber industry that shines in some of your dialogue? A couple of things. I, yes, I mean, I had ancestors who worked in it because uh, in Western North Carolina, you know, that was kind of the equivalent of coal mining in, in, in Kentucky, particularly in the early part of the 20th century. So I had relatives who did it. A um, couple who are still, you know, doing some pulp wood, that kind of thing. But um, I was very lucky in that I met, uh, when I was writing Serena about 2005, 2006, I met uh, two men who had been um, timber operators in the Smoky Mountains. I mean, they'd been timbermen, lumberjacks in, in the Smoky Mountains during that period. And they were, as I said, they were in their 90s, but they were still sharp. And, and when you can talk to somebody like that, you will learn things that will never be in a book. And the most interesting thing, the question I, I posed to one of them one day was, I said, what were you most afraid of? Because think of how many things, you know, rattlesnakes, hornets, falling, you know, saws, everything. And he said the widow makers. And the widow makers were when a tree fell, it, it would fall and, and hit other trees and, and limbs. And the limbs in the nearby trees, uh, torn off limbs would hang. And he said, I felt like I had control over everything else, but those, if they fell, and they're falling sometimes from 100 feet, uh, and it hit me, it would kill. And, and I was amazed when I did research how many men were killed just from a limb falling, not even that big a limb, uh, but the trajectory and the power of it. So uh, some research, uh, Certainly being in an area where you know, I'm only 10 miles from the Smoky Mountains Park, so I know it well. And uh, so uh, some research, but yeah, I did have family involved in that. Yeah. Uh, one question for you. In, in the Valley, you, you described the, the, uh, the dangers, mm -hmm. uh, not just from the animals. The rattlesnakes are a big factor in the book. Uh, all, copperheads, panthers, all different types of uh, animals. You, you describe that, uh, it's pretty frightening. But there was, there was so many injuries and so many deaths that there was a hospital at the foot of the mountain. They had a hospital, they'd, they'd haul people down to the hospital. Is that, I'm sure that's pretty accurate, right? Somewhat, I mean, I, it, yeah, they did. They, they would actually have a doctor there, yeah, always. Uh, you know, but I, I intensified some, but uh, it, when you look at the number of, you know, this is before you had any kind of, uh, 
you know, any kind of laws as far as work laws, safety laws. Right. And, uh, the, you know, when I was doing the research, these oral histories, I mean, you know, there'd be a guy that, I mean, they were actually just, it was almost like being in an army. You know, guys would fall. There were many people, you know, during the Depression, there were plenty of people who would come on in there. So it, it was just a terrible job, a dangerous job. And, uh, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they actually, it was just understood that, you know, you, your time would probably come sooner or later where you'd lose at least some fingers or toes. Yeah. I also got hungry uh, reading about your, your descriptions of the meals these guys would eat. I guess they burned so many calories. I mean, the work, work was brutal from sun up to yeah. sun. And uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I know that's accurate, but that's a lot of food for. Oh, that was, that is not, that was actually legit. I mean, that was absolutely dead on. I think it was some kind of outrageous thing, like 6,000 calories at least. I mean, and, and, and what they would do is they would just, they would stoke them. I mean, in the mornings, they would just eat this huge amount. So, uh, yeah, the timber owners, they always ate well, but they, they were burning so many calories. Yeah. And, and if you ever, there's some old pictures of those guys. And if you see them, I mean, you can tell they were tough men, but they were not carrying any loose weight. <laughs> we have another question uh, wanting to know from, bo from both of you, uh, who are some of your favorite contemporary writers? You might not want this question because you going to have to start naming names and not naming some names. Oh, wow. <laughs> Who wants that, to go that, first? That's, that's a nightmare question for a writer. <laughs> what do you think, John? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I, I, should, I should have a, a, a standard pat answer because I, people ask the question all the time. And, and they ask the question because they're really serious. They want to know what, you know, what other writers uh, like to read. And, and most, I tell students all the time, uh, I have yet to meet a writer who was not a voracious reader. Uh, we just read uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I read uh, a lot of news magazines and newspapers and stories online looking for, uh, looking for material or looking for issues or looking for stories about uh, trials or law firms or cases or appeals or courts. That, that's where, that's my interest. It's, it's all you know, related to the law. And, and to stay up on that stuff, I, I enjoy reading about it. I read a lot of nonfiction because uh, it's kind of like preparation for, uh, for what I write, wrongful convictions and prison reform and uh, the injustices in the criminal system, on and on and on. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of books, endless supply of books. And I find most of them fascinating. So I, there's a lot of nonfiction. And I also, I don't know about you, Ron, but when, I, when I'm writing fiction, I try not to read much of it because we all, we all want to read great writers um, and if, and when I'm reading a really good writer, a good book, I sometimes catch myself doing things, uh, at the typewriter that I wouldn't normally do. Uh, maybe yeah. the sentences get too long or they're too short or whatever. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm influenced by great writers. And so I try to stay away from fiction and just stick to nonfiction when I, when I'm, when I'm writing. But, uh, I, I enjoy reading, um, uh, the stuff I write, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the other lawyers who write, uh, Scott mm -hmm. Tarot's a favorite. Uh, I, I love crime fiction. I love uh, James Lee Burke and Michael Connolly and, you know, uh, Ian Rankin, a, a bunch of people like that that, I, that, they're, that I've met and, got, and know pretty well and have got to be friends with. And, uh, you know, it's like when we met, Ron. I mean, I've read your books. Your first book, uh, was it 2002, One Foot in Eden? Was that? Uh, yeah, that was 2000. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I read that book when it came out and, and uh, was just really taken with um, the story. The, you know, I love a murder mystery, uh, even though you can, they can't find the body, um, <laughs> but also just the beauty of the language. And, and, and uh, so I, I enjoy Southern fiction. I probably read uh, more contemporary writers than I, than I used to. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm all over the place. How about you? What do you enjoy? Reading? Yeah, well, I, I, I think... Uh... I can talk maybe more, yeah, short stories. Um, certainly, um, you know, uh, I, I really admire Alice Munro. And, and what I love about Munro's story, and, and it took me a while to figure out what it, it's, it, you just, you almost sense this, it's almost as if the story's telling itself. Uh, that, that sounds a bit vague, but uh, she, what she does, it seems very simple, but it's not. Uh, 
I think she's good. Uh, you know, I go back to William Gay, who was a friend. His stories, I think, are just incredible. Uh, Richard Ford has a new book of stories I think is very good. Uh, Alice Monroe, uh, I mean, besides her, Edna O'Brien. But the writer I've been going back to, and I don't know if it's the times or not, but um, I'd read Chekhov for decades, and I'd never quite, he'd, he'd never kind of broken through completely for me about how great he was. But I've been going back to him, and I, I don't know if it's just I'm older and wiser. Maybe I've read enough more enough to, but I don't, his stories, I, I think are the best I've ever read. I, I he's just on a level that, uh, uh, you know, if I could write one of one like him, I, I'd feel like I've done well. I met um, William Gay uh, at Square Books. Uh, when Richard, when did his first book come out? He was, uh, he was up in the years when his first book came out. Yeah, he was. Uh, I don't, you know, mid, late 90s, mid 90s. I, I'm saying, no, 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 mid 90s, maybe. Yeah. I got it here right next to him. <laughs> <laughs> but always, uh, always prepared. I, uh, well, one of, one of the other questions I asked from Ron is, how are the short stories in Valley organized? Is there a sense or structure to their organization? Uh, yeah, I, I intended there to be one. I hope it, it is. Um, I, the way I look at short story collections is that I want to be like CDs. I mean, that uh, the sum is greater than the individual parts. And so I'm, I'm always very conscious of where I place stories or which stories I put in a book. I had probably 17 or 18 stories, but I wanted to pick the ones that I felt would fit this book, not necessarily you know, there are a couple of stories that maybe were good enough, but I just didn't feel like they fit what I was trying to do. And so I set up the story deliberately uh, in several ways. Um, one, through time, I wanted to kind of weave through time. The stories start in the past, they go into the present. And I kind of like the idea that sometimes that, that the writer, the reader is, is a bit unmoored in time, that, you know, the reader might go from one story into the next, not quite know the time period at first. Um, but I did want to kind of, t I actually, because of COVID, I, I, it really influenced the, the stories that I picked. And uh, what I realized, and it wasn't so much conscious until the end, I realized that I wanted stories where people are in really tough situations, but then they're doing the best they can. And I think uh, my hope is that not in every story, but in, I think the most of the stories, you see people trying uh, if Faulkner has this great line, he said that uh, he believed that most people were a little bit better than their circumstances ought to allow. And I think to me that those are interesting moments in stories and in novels where you see characters who, who have that moment where, you know, sometimes they don't, sometimes they go work, but, but sometimes they kind of come up and, and those are interesting moments. And, uh, so yeah, and I wanted to end the, the stories on a, a note. This book is dedicated to my grandson, and I ended it with the last story is, a, is about a grandfather saving his grandson's life. So uh, nice. I think, yeah, all the, I wanted it to end with a very hopeful ending nice. as far as the story collection. Nice. How, long, how long will you work on a story? Oh man, uh, I'm slow. Uh, usually two months. Uh, you know, I'll do about 15 drafts. Uh, I mean, I'll, it takes about two weeks to get a pretty good draft. And then, you know, for me, we talked about this in Asheville. What I love, I hate first drafts. You know, I, what I love is once I get it where I can play with the language. That, that, that's what I enjoy the most. But uh, so uh, the hard part for me is always first drafts. So I'm, I'm terrible at it. And uh, so, ha so ha how many, roughly speaking, how many, uh, how many stories do you have now that you think you finished but have not been published? Uh, probably about 40. <laughs> Larry, Brown, <laughs> Larry Brown told me one time he had several dozen. He, was, he, had, he had like an inventory. And yeah. he'd go back and read them and, and say, you know, realize it wasn't, it wasn't good enough. But he was always yeah. constantly working on his inventory. And at some point, he put together a collection and, you know, I think Larry wrote over a hundred stories. Yeah. And you've written about that many too, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, 
it's funny because today I was thinking about a story I tried four years ago and I, I was thinking about it and you know I think maybe I've got I'm gonna go back to it now it's been about four years where I guess gave up and I think maybe uh, I, I might have it figured out now but that's kind of fun too I just never throw away anything right <laughs> Larry kept a list of the magazines that he would send stories to, and when it came back rejected, he would put a check by that by that magazine, then send it to the next magazine, then he'd take the next story and send it to the magazine that had just rejected the last one. <laughs> he said after the story got 30 rejections, he thought, well, maybe it's not good enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, William had that great story where for years he was only sending, I think it was to the New York or Harper's and Atlantic. <laughs> End up anywhere else. You, you've heard that story, haven't you, Rick? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he, he said, I can't get published, but he was only trying to Well, go to the top. Well, I think we're, we're, we've about run out of time. Uh, I'll remind the viewers that um, this has been recorded. So if you want to see it or you didn't catch some of it, you can, you can find it some way or another, I'm not sure how, maybe go to the Square Books website and we can tell you how. And again, we've been talking about In the Valley, Ron Rash's uh, new book of uh, short stories, with one novella, excellent book, uh, signed copies at Square Books. And if you can wait till October, you can get A Time for Mercy, uh, where Jake Brigance reappears in the uh, John Grisham oeuvre and uh, just, Two excellent books, wonderful conversation. I thank you both for uh, doing this today. And uh, any any last words, John, Ron? Well, just support your independent book. <laughs> okay, there we go. I think we both. No, I mean, yeah, you know, Malaprops carried my books. You know, the the poetry and the stories, and nobody else would. And you know, it was those stores, and actually, One Foot in Eden. The reason it gained you know, interest was um, Quail Ridge, you guys at Square Books, uh, Malapro, I mean, so uh, I owe so much to the Indies. Um, and uh, so we, we got to support each other. All right. Done your part and we need right. to do the same. Okay. Thank you. Amen. Ron. Well said. Well said. Thank you, John. Thanks, Rich. See okay. you, Ron. Okay. Thank you, John. Appreciate it.